All right, you guys ready to get started? Good. Uh, my name is Tiffany Rickey, and I have Martha with me, um, who's going to assist during this presentation should anything happen. And for those of you who have been coming uh, this summer, we've had some ups and downs, but we're, we're making it every lecture. We're doing good. So tonight I'm very excited um, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Wren. He is a cardiologist here in town, and I'm so excited to hear his presentation. Um, as many of you know, I'm a dietitian, so I, I love learning about uh, this uh, um, interest area just as much as you, if not more. So uh, tonight, Dr. Wren is going to talk about lengthening the health span. And Dr. Wren received his medical degree from the Tulane School of Medicine in 1978 and completed his cardiology fellowship at Brooks Army Medical School in Fort Sam, Houston, Texas. He enjoyed private practice in Alexandria, Louisiana from May 1987 to March of 2012. He joined the Harry and Sally, Harry and Sally Porter Heart and Vascular Center in Fairbanks in April of 2012. Dr. Wren is an alumnus of Louisiana State University and served in the United States Army Medical Corps for nine years. He is board certified in internal medicine, general cardiology, interventional cardiology, and cardiovascular CT. Dr. Wren shares his years of experience and a passion for patient-focused care at the Porter Heart and Vascular Center at Fairbanks Memorial Hospital. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Wren. Thanks, Tiffany. Thank you all for coming out despite the, uh, the rain. Um, I came early so that, you know, there's always an audiovisual problem. And uh, so it, we had a little bit of a problem, but Tiffany worked it out. But uh, while we were working it out, my wife left to go to buy an, to pick up an adapter from home. So um, I'll just repeat the lecture to her when I get home. We'll, we'll do that. <laughs> but my youngest daughter is here, and she can enjoy it. And, and again, thank you all for coming. Uh, you know, Tiffany, um, I, I guess it was November of last year, uh, she wanted to know the title of the lecture, maybe December, and but it's risky because I tend to change my lecture and my thoughts all the way up until the last moment. Uh, so um, I'm surprised that she knew it was lengthening health span uh, because I probably changed the title several times. But I think it's very important for us to stay healthy as long as we can. And what we're finding now is that um, to a certain degree, we are not living longer, but we are dying longer. We're finding younger and younger people with diabetes and with problems due to the way we live. So, uh, but it does not have to be that way. That's what I want to focus our attention on tonight. Uh, with, I like to define health span, talk about leading causes of death, the underlying causes of chronic disease, how do we determine risk? And that's very important. Um, I think I saw about two or three patients today who are, they're healthy people, but they may have problems. And the issue is, is there anything going on? Um, just going in and talking to your doctor, is, does that tell you what's going on? Uh, looking good to your family? Feeling okay? Or is there something going on internally that we can um, find out without being overly invasive? We'll talk about that. And, and we'll finish up with preventing and reversing chronic disease. Um, if we can prevent it, great. And if we, if we have to reverse it, then we should take those steps. Genetics plays a role. Genetics can be a problem. But we say that genetics will load the gun, but it takes the environment to pull the trigger. Exercise, how much uh, can exercise uh, be a problem if we do too much? And then also we'll talk about nutrition. Well, health span is the number of years we live disease-free. Lifespan is the number of years we live. And life expectancy is the number of years that um, we have remaining at any given age. So here's the, uh, in terms of what's well documented, the oldest living person uh, was um, uh, Jean Comont, who um, died in uh, 1998, she lived to be 122 years of age. Uh, she, um, I think she had two, two kids. 
she rode her bicycle until she was 90 years old. Um, she lived alone until she was 110, but she set the house on fire because she was losing her vision, not because she was losing her mind. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about her uh, as we go on. Um, so the question is, what do we do to live a long time? Well, if we are heavy thinkers, depending on what we're thinking about, um, you can shorten your life. The non-thinker who has no worries uh, generally lives a long time. Uh, this is debatable, but uh, supposedly the average lifespan of a caveman was about 16 years. But, you know, actually, yes, so there was high mortality at birth. Uh, there was high mortality early on in life. But um, if a cave person lived to, uh, to reach the age of 50, they would likely to go on to live to be 70 years of age. But as time went on, uh, life expectancy certainly uh, improved. With uh, the life in, in 500 BC, the expectancy was 20 years, and in 400 AD, about 35 years. And uh, lifestyles and hardships played a major role in short years of life. Uh, in terms of um, Jeanne Comont, um, she never worked. Uh, she married into a, a very wealthy family, and uh, but she was very active. She exercised a lot. Uh, she um, she loved olive oil. It's not the type of olive oil that we, we have. Hers was not highly processed. She loves chocolate. She ate 2.2 pounds of chocolate a week. <laughs> she did smoke, but apparently she only smoked, she, in the later years of life, she, don't, she smoked no more than two cigarettes a day. Um, so it's pretty interesting. So advances in medical technology have increased our lifespan uh, of humans to date. If we look at 1900, the life uh, span of a, a man was about 46 years, 48 years for a woman. 20, uh, 1925, 57, 60, and we see by the year 2000, 74 years for uh, a man and 79 for, for a woman. So how do we get to 100 candles? That's the question. Um, what's interesting about the centenarians is that they don't become sick um, until the, uh, the later years of life, around from age 97, and they die quickly for about nine years. Whereas for most of us living in Western civilizations, we become ill in our early 60s, and we remain ill and continue to die over a 19-year period of time. So we have a, quite a few years that are unhealthy. And the question is, how can we lengthen the uh, health span and live longer? So what are some of the underlying causes of chronic diseases? Well, uh, the major causes of chronic diseases are known. And um, if these risk factors were eliminated, at least 80% of all heart disease, and stroke, and type 2 diabetes would be prevented. Over 40% of the cancers would also be prevented if we were to do that. And what are the problems? Well, physical inactivity, tobacco use, and unhealthy diet are the leading modifiable risk factors that we face. So this is typical, you know, of, of, of many kids now uh, uh, lying around um, when they're out of school and eating highly processed foods. Um, a lot of what kids eat, we wouldn't really consider food. And the problem with this is that we're seeing more and more people who are overweight, with uh, overweight being defined as a body mass index greater than 25. So all of uh, Northern America, most of Central America, a great deal of South America, all of Australia. And then if you look at people being overweight uh, throughout the world, um, 40 to 59 percent of the people are overweight. And in our country, about a third of us are obese. So we look worldwide, 30% of women and 40% of men are now overweight, and 27% of women and 24% of men are obese. In China, where people were small, uh, the Chinese now have money, and they are eating more meat, milk, and eggs, and, and they are getting fat. In fact, a few years ago, I heard a, a presentation uh, or a report saying that Chinese kids were learning to dance to rap music to lose weight. Um, in South Africa, 56% of women, 29% of men, above the age of 15 are overweight or obese. 
And in the U.S., 39% of males and 32%, 33% of females over the age of 20 are obese. So in 2007, um, it was an estimated 22 million children under the age of five were overweight throughout the world. So what happens with uh, obesity? Well, the same foods that would cause us to be overweight or obese will cause various diseases, such as pulmonary disease with uh, sleep apnea, hyperventilation syndrome, um, cirrhosis due to fatty liver, gallbladder disease, gynecological problems with infertility, polycystic ovarian syndrome, arthritis due to the heavy weight, um, genus uh, stasis changes causing phlebitis. There's increased risk of cancer uh, because of fat cells uh, uh, having receptors that increase estrogen levels, um, hypertension, lipid problems, diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, cataracts, and on and on. So, you know, we actually are facing uh, what may be the first generation of American kids who uh, would have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. And it's not unusual now for me to see a uh, 70, 75-year-old parent bringing their 50, 55-year-old child in with a heart attack or with some uh, chronic illness that's shortening their lives. Here's a case, uh, a young woman who uh, presented to us with... Um, a plaque in an artery, and she was having a heart attack. And then we did a balloon angioplasty to open up this vessel, and then ended up with a good result. But at the age of 40, she's already has a shortened health span. Leading causes of death in our country? Well, heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic lung disease, diabetes. You see, the ones in blue are those causes of death which are associated with uh, diet and inactivity. How do we determine risk? Well, this is very important. Uh, so if you're at age 75 um, in this country, in our country, the way we live and the way we eat, you're at high risk. Without any doubt, you're at high risk. A very low-risk person would have a total cholesterol less than 200, Less than 150 is better. We don't see heart attacks generally until the total cholesterol level is above 150. If you have a blood pressure less than 120 over, less than or equal to 120 over 80, if you're not diabetic, you've never smoked, no family history of heart attack before the age of uh, 55 in men, before the age of 65 in women, and if you don't have metabolic syndrome, we will talk about metabolic syndrome, but if you don't have those things, then you are at very low risk. Uh, in general, uh, women, uh, in terms of being an increased risk, you know, by the age of menopause, women do exceed men. But a woman with one or more of these following risk factors are at increased risk. Smoking, poor diet, sedentary, obesity, family history, men less than 55, women less than, 50, uh, 50, uh, less than 55. High blood pressure, um, metabolic syndrome, poor exercise tolerance. Um, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, history of diabetes during pregnancy or with preeclampsia or hypertension during uh, pregnancy or increased uh, or risk factors for women. So metabolic syndrome, if you have one of the three of the following, um, a waist circumference greater than 35 inches in a woman, greater than 40 inches in a man, high, a high triglycerides greater than 150, Cholesterol, uh, LD, HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, less than 50 in a woman, less than 40 in a man. Elevated blood pressure above 130 or 85. Fasting glucose above 100. Any three of the following, then you have metabolic syndrome, which means there's increased risk of diabetes and increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, one can go online, and there's a risk estimator, and, and um, um, my students and I, we we'll do this frequently in patients who come in because they want to know, am I sick? Do I have a problem? Do I need to take a statin? Well, you, uh, with this online risk calculator, you put in the gender, male or female, the age of the person, uh, the race, HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol, the total cholesterol, blood pressure, whether there's diabetes or not, 
high blood pressure and whether one smokes, and then you get a 10-year risk calcula calculation for your chances of developing a cardiac event. So here's an example of a 60-year-old uh, um, white male, well, white female, actually, and uh, with a total cholesterol, we said was 240, HDL of 30, blood pressure, systolic pressure of 150, uh, no high blood pressure, no diabetes, not a smoker, the 10-year risk is 7.7%. If the risk is 7.5 or greater, then that person should um, benefit from a, from a statin. Another thing that I would do in a patient like this, if you're at increased risk, is to have uh, the patient undergo what's called a coronary calcium score. Now, that's a uh, CAT scan of the chest to see if there's hardening of the arteries. Um, I saw a patient uh, yesterday who had a, he feels fine, uh, only 58 years old, and uh, his brother died suddenly at age 51. And he wants to know, am I all right? Well, his primary care physician um, advised him to have a coronary calcium score. Now, normal is zero. Above 400 is high. If it's 1,000, you're likely to have a heart attack or an event, 20% uh, chance within a year. Um, so th this patient's score was about 800, but he feels fine. We did an exercise stress test, and he passed with flying colors. But that doesn't mean that he's not at high risk. Um, what it means, though, is that we have time now to try to stabilize his plaque. There's certainly plaque there, and try to reverse the plaque. Some of you may remember Tim Russert with Face the Nation who died suddenly about 15 years ago, I think now, maybe 10 years, 10, 10 years. But at age 42, Tim had a coronary calcium score, and his score was 220. That doesn't sound high, but at age of 40, uh, for a man 42 years of age, uh, that placed him in the 90th percentile. If you're in the 90th percentile, uh, you're likely to have uh, a, a heart attack within 10 years, a, a sudden cardiac death. And so if you have, have calcium in your coronaries, and this shows calcium in the left main coronary, this is the left anterior descending, this is a ramus branch in the circumflex artery, um, with this amount of calcification, then um, the best thing to do is to become vegan, have no meat, no milk, no eggs, no oil, to reverse the plaque. Um, that's the best thing to do. Call with us to show that you can prevent heart attacks by doing that. Uh, Tim didn't do that. His doctors didn't advise him because I, I think at the time that he had his calcium score, uh, we were not as aggressive as we are now. So a score of zero is, means no plaque. Minimal plaque at a uh, score of 10. Anything above 10 is, is, is a problem. A uh, score of uh, up to 100, definite plaque, significant plaque at greater than 400. The problem with the test here is that it costs about $300 and insurance companies may not pay for it. Sometimes they pay for it, sometimes they don't. But it is a worthwhile test to do. Now, I would recommend a coronary casting score in someone who's never had a heart problem because if you've already had a stent or bypass, you don't need that. We know you have disease and you have to be treated aggressively. I recommend it for women over the age of 55 or men over the age of 45. Women don't develop disease as early as we do, and they outlive us too. But um, so, and then the problem is being radio sensitive. By the time a woman's age 55, that's not such a concern about radiation exposure, and the same for a man by the time he's 45 years of age. So I do think it's a very good test. So preventing and reversing disease, what do we do? Well, in terms of genetics, well, some people are born with genetics that would prevent them from disease. Uh, if you look at the uh, Ashkenazi Jews, they have a gene mutation that lowers their risk of uh, Alzheimer's, hypertension, and diabetes. The old order Amish also have a uh, gene mutation that causes lowering of cholesterol and lowers their risk of cardiovascular disease by 65%. That's just despite diet. Uh, patients with Lorentz syndrome who are dwarf uh, have a gene mutation in uh, growth hormone receptor. They never have cancer, no matter what they eat or smoke. 
They don't have diabetes. And um, Japanese Americans also have a gene mutation, of, particularly in the males, that lower their risk by 40%, and cancer risk is lowered by 55%. This is important because of what's happened with the Human Genome Project. Now that these genes have been identified, uh, there will be ways to manipulate genes, and those of us who are not born with them, to lower cholesterol and to give us the same benefits. And I would predict that within the next 10 years that we will see um, newer therapies available um, because of what we know now, because of genetics. But now, many of us are not born with those genes, and most of us not. So we have to do more. Okay? And one thing we can do is to exercise. Um, I think it was about 1 o'clock this morning when I put this slide in. So hopefully nothing put in upside down. Um, Dr. Bartley, uh, one of the um, uh, outstanding practice doctors, called me one day and said, hey, uh, I want you to look at this article. And I have uh, several uh, young men who exercise a lot, and you think there's anything to this. So and, and it, it is. This is a great study uh, looking at cardiovascular damage resulting from chronic excessive endurance exercise. And many people in, uh, in Fairbanks love to run, which I think is great. That's one reason why, I, after being here three years, I decided to stay for it no less than another five. Uh, because of the, uh, the, uh, the resilience of the people here and how, how tough people are. You know, we, when we look at uh, running like marathons, the first person running a marathon of Philippides, you know, actually ran within two days about 150 miles. And, of course, he died at the end of his last run. Um, <laughs> and and um, now there was a... Um, the Galloping Ghost, who uh, was a uh, famous fellow who uh, ran, uh, um, oh, let's go back, a tremendous amount. Uh, he used to run, oh, like 400 miles in a day, and uh, he was called Caballo Blanco. Um, uh, Christopher McDougal uh, is not the fellow, what's his name here? Um, I don't have it here. But anyway, he went out for just a short run and was found dead. He died suddenly. So what has been found is that um, if you look at exercise and running, that if you run anywhere from one to five miles per hour, so any amount of walking, if you walk a cover mile in, in 20 minutes or less, or if you run up to five miles per hour, you reduce your risk uh, by about 10%. If you run at a rate of about six miles per hour, your uh, mortality rate drops even more. And up to seven miles per hour, your mortality rate goes down. But if you're running faster or in a mile, in, uh, greater than eight miles per hour, then you lose those benefits. And you start approaching, again, the usual mortality. The reason for this is that with long, um, long running for hours at a rapid rate, uh, there are changes in the, in the right ventricle. The right ventricle enlarges. The strength of it goes down. This stays down for several weeks and then gradually comes back up. And after high endurance intensity exercise over and over and over again, uh, what we find is that uh, there's right heart strain, right heart dilatation, the right heart becomes weak, it becomes scarred, uh, one develops atrial arrhythmias. Uh, it's also been found that the coronaries, although they enlarge, they become hardened and firm and calcified. And this leads to uh, sudden cardiac death in those people who perform um, endurance uh, uh, exercises. So too much exercise is also detrimental. <coughs> so let's move on to, to how we eat. You know, so what comes with the steak? Well, rice peel off a baked potato, but also cancer, heart disease, and, and uh, other diseases. You know, so uh, Cleveland Clinic um, published a study in May of 2013 showing that the, uh, the oil of eggs, which is phosphatidylcholine or lecithin, and also L-carnitine, which is in red meat, um, will be metabolized by bacteria in the gut. So choline um, will become acted on by bacteria. Let's look at this slide. So phosphatidylcholine, the choline portion has three methyl groups. 
This is acting on by gut flora and forms um, trimethylamine. This goes into the liver where the um, there are oxidases within, within the liver that will oxidize this in, um, at a um, hydroxyl group and form trimethylamine in oxide, which is a free radical. The point is that this is a free radical, and then this free radical would oxidize LDL and cause plaque in arteries. So the higher the TMAO level, the more likely one would suffer a heart attack, stroke, or death. And this was, it didn't matter what the cholesterol level was, whether well, it was good, bad, or indifferent. Um, so red meat and, um, and lecithin, apostatocholine, and yellow eggs will do this. Um, and what was interesting was that when they gave steak and eggs to a vegetarian, this did not occur because vegetarians have different gut flora that will not produce this. And to become vegetarian, one had to be on a vegetarian diet for about nine months for the, for the flora to change. So free radicals are organic molecules responsible for aging, tissue damage, and possibly some diseases. They're very unstable. Uh, so they bind to other molecules and they can cause DNA disruption. Um, antioxidants, which are present in many foods, are molecules that prevent free radicals from harming healthy tissue. So antioxidants are found in what we call functional foods. Uh, these foods uh, have phytochemicals, which are um, neutralized free radicals, reduce heart disease, cancer risk. They're found in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, and wine, and wine, yeah. But not too much wine, just, just, just the right amount. So, uh, so what, are some top, uh, what are some antioxidant foods? Well, the top 10 antioxidant foods are, um, are as follows. I, I was surprised to see this, that the small red kidney bean was at the top of the list. Now, did Sally come? Sally Mango? Okay, that's one of my students, and she actually did a lot of research on the Alaskan blueberry. And when I showed, talked to her about this, she said, no, no way. The Alaskan blueberry has more antioxidants than, than any other, uh, any food. And, and I would uh, um, have to agree with that. Um, but the small red kidney bean has, is loaded with antioxidants also. Um, wild blueberries uh, were listed as number, number two. Uh, large red kidney beans and legumes, pinto beans. Beans are very good for us. And then people who live a long time, they eat uh, uh, quite a few beans. Uh, now the cultured blueberries are also high in antioxidants, number five. Cranberries, artichokes, blackberries, prunes, and um, raspberries. So we look at this list, there are other things on this list. Well, this list is very long, but uh, when we drop below the top 10, we see um, apples, pecans. Uh, I was also a little surprised to see that the russet potato was higher on the list than uh, actually um, sweet potatoes, uh, plums, black beans. Well, the walnuts are very good for us. It's just one of them in the top ten for, and then actually there are foods that are good for us that are uh, for other reasons other than their antioxidant um, abilities. But no, walnuts are great for us. And again, as I mentioned about um, um, Jean Camant, um, uh, her diet was rich in olive oil. She ate 2.2 pounds of chocolate every week. She liked port wine, and she remained calm. She didn't get upset about much of anything. <laughs> so um, when we look at um, areas of the world where people live to be 100 and who are healthy and don't need cardiologists, um, there are five places. Um, Sardinia, um, Okinawa, Costa Rica, Loma Linda, California, and then a few months ago, uh, Icaria, Greece was found to be another area where people live to, uh, frequently live to be 100. Um, when they reported this on CNN, they said a, a 110-year-old lady went to the bank to get a loan, and she was turned down because they said they don't make those bank loans to anyone who's over the age of 100. Um, <laughs> 
So, so what did centenarians eat? Well, um, well, in Sardinia, uh, Sardinia, the men drink red wine three times a day. Um, the men, the women carry the guns and, uh, and do all the official work business for the house. The men tend to goats and and uh, and walk up and down the hills. Um, <laughs> And the wives don't fuss at them. Um, they have a plant-based diet with small amounts of red meat in Sardinia. In Loma Linda, California, you eat a lot of nuts. Yeah, so nuts are important. Uh, when I met Dan Buechner, who wrote this book, The Blue Zones, uh, when I picked Dan up from the airport, he said, let's get some nuts. And I said, well, I'm not supposed to have that. And he said, what? He said, everywhere I go in the world, people who live a long time um, eat nuts. So I said, great. I'll, I'll, let's go get some nuts, and I'll just tell my daughter that I'm with Dan Buechner, and he says it's okay. But nuts are good for us. Now, if you're trying to lose weight, we would limit the nuts because of the fat content, you know. But, um, but no, but nuts are good for us. Uh, in Loma Linda, uh, in general, they're vegetarian. Uh, they vary from being like the ovo vegetarian, pesco vegetarian, fish eating vegetarians, to um, uh, being vegan or Semi-vegetarian or non-vegetarian? The semi-vegetarian and non-vegetarian Adventists don't do any better than the rest of us. So the ones who do live longer are the like to ovo, pesco vegetarian, or the vegan uh, Adventists. And they drink plenty of water. In the Adventist health study, it was found that if a man drinks at least five glasses of water a day, he reduces his risk of a heart attack by 50%. What's the, the, the early dinner? Is Adrian here? Adrian is a dentist. I'm not sure. Well, one would think that it would be no later than six, but you're right. The, the heaviest meal. It, and it, it is uh, at eight or something. Uh, yeah, sure do. Yeah. Yeah, and then I'm also told that the dentists don't tend to eat between meals. They don't tend to do a lot of snacking. Um, and in Okinawa, uh, Okinawa, um, uh, they stop eating when they're about 80% full, and they have a plant-based diet with soy. Uh, in Costa Rica, there's hard water with a lot of calcium. Largest meal in the morning, so that's another common thing. And they don't have much meat. They have some eggs, uh, like the salted uh, uh, tortillas, beans, lots of beans, and squash. In Korea, Greece, uh, wild greens, herbal teas, goat's milk. And uh, their diet is high in beans and vegetables, low in meat and sugar, not much fish, but high in potatoes. So Caldwell Esselstyn, for someone who has, let's say you have calcium in your coronaries, you want to prevent disease, what Dr. Esselstyn did was to place patients on a, a plant-based, 8% fat diet with a small amount of cholesterol medication, and he lowered cholesterol from 246 down to 132. <coughs> um, 18 patients who had previously had coronary events during eight years prior to study had no events during 20 years of follow-up. Six patients who uh, went on the usual American Heart Association diet did have more events. So on, with no meat, no milk, no eggs, no oil, he was able to prevent heart attacks. And he's late, late, lately he's repeated this study in 200 people and 90% uh, had the same outcome. So, in general, for foods that we emphasize for healing, there are uh, raw vegetables, whole grains, green and herbal teas, steamed vegetables, nuts and seeds sparingly, uh, whole fresh fruits, fruits, legumes, herbs and spices, lean, non-green fed meats. However, there's an asterisk here that says uh, this does not promote healing meat, but if you, uh, you know, if it's non-grain fed and it's wild, it's not nearly as bad for us as, as uh, processed meats. And another thing too about wild um, meat is that uh, it has more omega-3 fatty acid. So if you're going to have meat, it should be wild and, um, and only small amounts for someone who's trying to reverse disease. What should we avoid? Well, we should avoid all dairy products, eggs, um, most cooking and salad oils, um, addictive foods, uh, fried foods, 
eggs, artificial sweetness we should avoid, high fructose corn syrup, and refined sugar. Um, if you're going to use oil, then avoid these. These are processed too much. Some examples. If you use oils, then choose organic oils because then you can avoid GMOs and hexane e extraction. If you use extra virgin olive oil, <coughs> who would that pop against us to kill this cat? Yeah. Will you? Yeah. Where'd you find it? <laughs> All right, so that, my wife says there's Papa Vince's in Fairbanks somewhere. Yeah, I did pull it out of the mission box and it was Papa Vince's. Okay, well, yeah, that's great. Uh, let's, um, let's go back to that. Yeah, so um, we have some oils that are not so bad. Uh, Papa Vince's, extra virgin sesame oil you can use for low heat sauteing, uh, Nutiva hemp oil uh, for cold applications such as salads, dips, and some smoothies. This information is from the um, Benny Howry, who has the, um, oh, what she call herself? The um, food bank. Food bank, yeah, food bank, yeah. I think her work is good, don't you? you see that? Yeah. Okay, so we'll come to a uh, close here. The doctor in the future will no longer treat human frame with drugs, but rather will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. Thomas Edison said that. <coughs> And uh, the other thing, is, which is an ancient Egypt, Egyptian proverb, one quarter of what you eat keeps you alive, and the other three quarters keeps your doctor alive. Okay, questions? I beg your pardon? You know, oh, yeah, I should do that. Yeah, we'll do, I'll, I'll do that, okay? Uh, Tiffany will make sure we get that done. This is, inf um, uh, more questions? Sorry. Yes, sir. Yeah, so what's recommended uh, with JNC8? Um, Carlos, or are you? There he is. So, what does JNC8 say about age and hypertension? Should we better, greater than 60 or less than 60? Yes. Yeah, so greater than 60. So, if someone over the age of 60, uh, 150 over 90 is where we get excited. But, and that is in terms of using drugs. But that doesn't mean that that's a healthy blood pressure. A completely normal blood pressure um, uh, is 105 over about 65. Anything above that, there's increased risk. Uh, that's why we pay more for insurance as blood pressure goes up. However, it's not a good idea to treat people until you get to a certain level. And we're finding that when we treat too early, we don't help issues, particularly if we lower the, uh, the diastolic pressure to below 60. That, that's that's uh, increases mortality. But I do have patients uh, lose weight, um, reduce the sodium um, content in food. Uh, not all of us have to avoid salt. Some people are salt sensitive, others are not. And um, do all the things that, to, to stay healthy uh, and then the blood pressure will settle out to where it needs to be. But right, at age 60, we, don't, we won't add a drug until you're above 150 over 90. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I don't keep going back and forth on eggs. And this is just recent data from uh, Cleveland Clinic looking at the issue with trimethylamine in oxide. And they still haven't worked out. So this was all done in their research labs. There's not a general test for TMAO. Um, now, if one should eat eggs, you know, uh, stay, eat organic eggs if you're going to eat them. And um, I, I wouldn't overdo it. Um, with that. Yeah, so with egg whites, then you're looking at still animal protein. Uh, when Colin Campbell did the China study, um, 
they looked at um, in terms of making cancer grow uh, in, um, in experimental animals. Um, they used casein, um, um, which is um, you know milk, one of the milk proteins, and it can make cancer grow. If they took casein away, cancer would stop growing. And what he found was that that represented any well, what would happen with any animal protein. With egg whites, you have just pure protein. So, uh, um, and when Esselstyn did his work, he said, well, you don't have eggs, not even egg whites. Now, with the yolk, the issue is with phosphatidylcholine, with lecithin, with forming this free radical that would cause um, LDL to become oxidized and cause plaque and arteries. Um, so, in general, if we want to slow down the aging process, if we want to prevent the growth of cancer, we minimize animal protein. Yes, that's a great question. Um, uh, there are supplements that um, we, and I'm, I may have a slide here on that. Let's look at that. Not all supplements are actually antioxidants. Uh, uh, what, um, I don't know about, yes. Okay, this is it. So here's a list of what women generally think would be uh, antioxidants, uh, but they're not truly antioxidants. For instance, green tea, blueberries, dark chocolate, wine, and turmeric, okay? They have a hormetic effect, and that is with um, uh, mitochondrial hormesis. You stress that portion of the cell and you actually make it more resilient to oxidation because you have given it a little bit of what could be a toxin. Uh, an example would be vitamin A, which in small amounts will make the, high, uh, the eye healthy. In large amounts, vitamin A is very dangerous for us. So uh, studies that have been done looking at giving antioxidants uh, to patients, and we, they found increased mortality. So what nature offers is in, is in the right balance and just the right amount. But when we take it and put it into a pill form, and that's called reductionism, when you take that, concentrate it, and put it into a tablet or a pill, then we have thrown the body out of balance. And, um, and, and because something that would be good, um, it becomes dangerous. So here's a study um, looking at uh, hormetic dietary phytochemicals. And this was um, uh, published in, in 2008. And what was found was that um, uh, their finding was that um, some, um, a certain amount of cell stress inducing phytochemicals in varieties of fruits and vegetables normally consumed by humans will um, fall within a low dose uh, stimulatory range of concentrations. That is, make us better. But then if you certain foods can concentrate these and cause a problem. They felt that it was that, co that consumption of phytochemicals in the form of concentrated supplements has the potential for adverse health consequences if the doses consumed exceed the toxic threshold. And we may exceed the toxic threshold whenever we go, we do more than what nature normally pro provides. So uh, the filling by Colin Campbell, Esselstyn, um, John McDougall, uh, a lot of leaders in, in nutrition would say, let's not supplement. Uh, the only supplement that most would recommend would be um, vitamin D3. And, and that's not proven yet. Uh, Brigham and Women's is doing a study now looking at vitamin D3 in 10,000 people throughout the U.S. And um, some will get vitamin D3, some will not. And uh, they'll look at, they're going to look at the rates of cancer and heart disease. So in general, we should avoid supplements and get out uh, vitamins and antioxidants from whole foods. Yeah, so B12, if, you, for instance, if you're strictly vegan, then there may be a, a reason to, to give uh, B12, yes. And I do know that um, um, Joel Furman um, actually has his vitamins that he gives. 
And I haven't looked at the concentration on that. And Joel does feel that in some people you have to safely give supplements. But then I would, uh, if, if, if so, if I were to take one, I would more likely take something that he's recommending because he's one of the leaders in the field too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, let me just kind of start at the end and work back. Uh, for instance, with rice, if one eats white, white rice more than um, two times a week, you increase the risk of diabetes by 40%. And uh, that's one thing that Furman talks about all the time, that we're seeing much uh, higher rate of uh, increasing rates of diabetes and in, um, in uh, China, Japan, and also Korea. Uh, but if you eat brown rice more than twice a week, the risk of diabetes goes down. Uh, there's another difference, too, in, in many countries where there's a lot of rice being eaten is that the activity level is, is uh, greater. And um, so it's better to have brown rice if one is going to, to eat rice. Uh, the other thing, too, is that um, if you look at uh, the places where people live a long time, and there was Okinawa, um, which is not quite the same as, as Japan, but um, in, terms of, in terms of how they eat. Uh, for instance, Okinawans eat very little fish. Uh, in those places, it's high carb. Uh, like 70% of the calories are from complex carbs. Again, with a high activity level, but they were complex carbs. Uh, McDougall wrote a book called The Starch Solution, where he really uh, pushes um, the fact that if you eat complex carbs, you don't get that, that um, glucose spike in high insulin surges that, that one would get um, with... Um, with eating simple carbs. It really makes a difference. Uh, but it is important, though, I, my feeling is that if you're going to be on a high-carb diet, com even complex carbs, one needs to exercise. Um, and that, that makes a difference. Um, I do have some patients who um, just say that they have a major problem anytime they have carbs with their diabetes and, uh, and are trying other approaches um, to do that. The issue, though, is that if you're making the blood sugar to look better, are, are we really um, reducing plaque in arteries? And that's what we don't know. You know, uh, from the, pop, from the um, for instance, the China study, which is more of a study of e ecology in terms of what uh, would they, everything was measured that they, uh, those people ate and what they excreted and, um, and how they interacted with their environment. And what was found was that when animal protein was more of a condiment, that there was a big difference. Uh, when the Chinese migrated to the cities and had meat, milk, and eggs, there was increased risk of breast cancer and heart disease. But rural Chinese who ate mainly a plant-based diet, those problems uh, were not seen. Uh, so still with my patients, I have many patients who lose weight by becoming vegetarian and some becoming vegan. Um, and I would say that about 40% of my patients um, will, will do this and, and do show a, an improvement, T particularly when one reduces the amount of oil in the diet. Uh, that gives us a lot of empty calories that, that we just don't need. Yeah. And I, I hope I kind of touched it. Yes? Yeah, um, I travel a bit to probably – trips out of the country more than five months a week. Um, and I notice that when I, my body is not happy when I'm home. I suspect the solution is not the Mediterranean diet, but the problem is the American diet, what is available. And, and more specifically, uh, I think that the gut fauna is compromised in the States. Are there any studies to find out whose gut fauna works <laughs> and whose doesn't and why not? Like uh, corn, there's studies. Like corn, there's... Uh, it's a registered pesticide. 
Um, and I don't think it kills us, but it uh, your health span is uh, severely limited because we are a relationship with our gut health. It doesn't work. We don't work. Yes. Yeah, so are you when you when you're traveling? Are you getting more fiber and or you get you're getting less processed food when you? I eat less fiber when I travel. I eat at home. I I eat okay. I'm not that great at it. I'm not that bad at it. But uh, I think this, the more specific difference is not the change in diet, but the fact that if I come home, I'm going to fatten up and dumb down. I just really feel the difference when I'm home. And mm -hmm. it, I, I have almost a statistical perspective because I travel so much. At when? And my it's, it it my constitution just goes catty once here home. But there's a big difference in your diet versus traveling versus Not here. That much. Not that much. Yeah, oh. there's a big difference. Yeah. In I'm eating yeah. food there and I'm eating food here. That's the difference. <laughs> You're eating food there and what here? I'm eating mean food here, but the food here yeah. is uh, does the food in the United States. What does the food in the United States oh. do over our gut? Yeah. Yeah, so one question, one issue, though, is that just how much, in a way, are we affected by uh, GMOs? Because so much of our food is g g genetically modified, unless you're getting organic. And if you, if you can, it, but you have to trust that is if it's truly organic. And I know there are some issues there that something may be labeled organic and is not, you know. Um, you know, so for instance, uh, with people who have gluten intolerance, uh, lately, it's been shown that it's not really gluten, but it's uh, Roundup uh, that the wheat has been sprayed with just before it's harvested. You know, so there are there are issues, uh, major issues with um, um, in terms of insecticides. And um, um, if you look at, for instance, um, sugarless gum and aspartame, it's been shown now that that has an effect on thyroid function due to causing um, an autoimmune problem. Uh, so, so much in the way of um, uh, food substitutes cause problems. And I think it just boils down to our not having whole food and, and food that's been altered to make it have a longer shelf life and to be able to ship it, you know, to uh, further places. Do you exercise more when you travel? It's not that? Here. Okay. Right, so when I spoke to Edson about that, it, his statement was uh, that there was a study that was done uh, looking at medical students who um, they took um, bread and dipped it in, in uh, olive oil and, and ate a slice of bread. And then within, for an hour after eating that, uh, their blood vessels did not re, uh, re relax and uh, they lost their um, the hyperemic response. They could not e improve circulation if, if they needed it. So that was one issue uh, that he had with that. Another issue um, is that uh, the amount of saturated fat in oil, but okay, so why not just minimize it? You know, so what has not been done is to say, what if you're using organic oil and uh, it just hadn't been studied? So. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're not having a drop of oil. We're yep. really hurting the animal. Right. <laughs> I understand. But, yeah, it, we, and, and we just don't know. Um, so but, but, but. Well, yes, if to, to get reversed. Now, if your numbers are great and, and if you are having a small amount from time to time, no one knows if that's okay. We do know this, that uh, the Mediterranean diet, um, oh, for instance, um, in Icaria, Greece, um, I do think that they had oil. Yeah, uh, but it's not heavily processed. Well, we said we don't know. We know that Esselstyn did that because when he reviewed populations that didn't have disease, he didn't see oil in, the, in their diets. However, the oil here is not the same unless we're getting the non-GMO, getting the organic, and the stuff that's not heavily processed. Uh, so unfortunately, we just don't have any large number of people where this has been done. But if, uh, I would suggest that if one should have oil, it should be organic, you know, uh, and use the... Um, the extra version of olive oil, like the Papa Vince's, that just cold pressed and, and not altered it, uh, as much. Yeah. And as long as your numbers are looking good, too, I think that's very important. Uh, but that's the, no one says, 
has studied what you have other than what we see with the Mediterranean diet. And we know that over and over again with many studies that there's better outcomes with the Mediterranean diet. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's true, and in fact, there's a recent report saying that uh, in places where there's um, a lot of traffic and noise, cortisol levels are higher, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and and stress is very important. That's what you know, like with the um, Comant, uh, Jean Comant, who lived a long time, she she always remained calm. And in time, we become upset and angry. We increase the uh, release of free radicals and and worry a lot. So that has a lot to do with it, and actually with so it's not just food, it's also the lifestyle uh, of those people. For instance, with the Adventists who, uh, once a week, they get away from other people and just deal with family and, and, and spend time with family. And, um, and then uh, when Buechner uh, in, in Blue Zone said, wine at five, he mentioned calming down, just relaxing, taking some time to just get away from it all. So that has a, a lot to do with it. In fact... Um, um, Adrian, who worked with me with some of the stuff on the handouts we give, uh, who's at the dentist, uh, and I kind of get an argument. She says, "Well, even if you have coronary disease, or whatever, you're going to do much better if you if you are um, lower your stress level." And I said, "Well, okay, that may be true, but I'd rather have clean arteries than then then maybe you can handle the stress." But but stress is very important. The Okinawans, for instance, um, during World War II lived off potatoes, and it was amazing how they handled the stress of that time. Uh, so that's, that's very important. Yeah. In fact, more people die suddenly on Monday than any other day of the week. A sudden death on Monday, and that was just, uh, ascribed to going back to work. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Well, you could. I mean, what we, what, but it's not studied. We, we just don't know. In fact, I was telling my wife the other day, um, you know, with all the smoke in the air. Uh, so there's this, um, uh, what's been discovered, uh, or environmentally persistent free radicals uh, that become attached to, harmful chemicals, chemicals get attached to soot and particles in the air, the PM2.5, and we inhale that. And that's more dangerous than, than smoking 300 cigarettes when we inhale that. So if you have that going on, then it may be that taking additional antioxidants may work, but no, no one knows, you know what I mean? So there may be a situation where, where you need or where you could benefit from that, but we just don't know. But we do know this, that in those places in the world where people live a long time, they don't supplement. They just eat whole food, and they, they exercise, and they walk, and they enjoy life. Um, you know, so uh, that's why I just uh, really think that's important that we talk about that in terms of how do we live in terms of living a long time. Yeah. yeah. It does, yeah. Anyway, so a large study has been done giving antioxidants. It was vitamin A, C, and um, one other, and there was increased mortality. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just, it's just so much better to to not to need pills for me, and not to take supplements because it's, it's there in your food. Just eat. eat. An apple has about eight thousand phytonutrients. I would recommend an organic apple, but. Uh, and you know, you know, when you look at the blue code, you know when it's organic, right? Um, yeah, the five, yeah, five numbers. The first one starting with nine, um, because of the amount of insecticide. Um, and then two, this time of year, we should all have a garden, and uh, and eat from that garden. 
I mean, they're just so much better than, than getting highly processed stuff. And, and, um, but it just has never been proven. It has never been proven that taking supplements prolongs life. It never has. Uh, if you want to read more about that, then look at uh, the chapter on reductionism in the book, The China Study, by Colin Campbell. And um, uh, just read about that. I've looked at those. And in fact, I talked to um, John McDougall about that. When I mentioned that, he turned red. He was, and he, just, he said, I, I know what he says. I don't agree, you know, and, and uh, yeah. But, you know, as long as we've been on a high carb diet, we need to exercise. I, I think if you're going to have high carbs, you just can't sit around. Um, two, yeah. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of wheat belly, he mentions that the wheat now is not the same. This, 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 this wheat that's been modified so that it has a heavier stock to hold more and that we don't metabolize it quite the same, you know. Yeah. Yeah, no, so the, the thing I like about that is that it starts out by saying that we should have fruits and vegetables. So it's for, all, for every blood type, you can have fruits and vegetables. Yeah. But then, again, um, and then, so there's, there's a review article uh, that the American College of Cardiology did looking at various diets. And, um, and what it said about that one is that there's just no research to know that that really makes a difference. So there's no large study to say that it's going to help someone to um, prevent disease, live longer, uh, and whatever. So uh, do I believe in it? Not really. But I do like the fact that it starts out with saying, you know, you can all, everyone can have fruits and vegetables. Um, and which, I had a slide here that was kind of interesting. If you looked at the, um, I think it's this one. Have you seen this? Uh, looks at uh, carnivores versus herbivores versus, um, uh, Proved of course in the human in terms of um, it looks at different things uh, like the mouth difference in the mouth and whether we have um, uh, Like with the carnivore that there are no uh, enzymes in the mouth uh, There but they have a, a different pH in the stomach um, In the human like for we're very similar to the her herbivore um, and that we do have um, enzymes in the mouth to start breaking down plants um, so it's kind of interesting that we are more like the uh, the herbivore in terms of how we are, uh, in terms of the uh, intestine is much longer uh, in the human than it is in the uh, uh, the carnivore. But of course, you know we have freedom of choice, and we and there are certain things we want, and we eat those things we want. But frequently, it will. Uh, I mean, I, I tell my friends and family, I, I guess some of my patients that, you know, it's, we, it, we just shouldn't eat each other. It's not nice. Um, <laughs> and it probably shouldn't eat other animals either. Um, but if we do, it should be a big celebration, you know, and, 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 and it should not be processed and um, um, should be wow, and um, which is different. And then if you have to go out and hunt and do and do things, it's just a difference in your exercising. You're doing more rather than just walk, going to the store and picking up a uh, package of processed uh, meat. Yeah. Yes, sir. From the point of view of an immediate evaluation, I understood you to say that getting this calcium score scan was a good thing. Is that also to an indication of plaque that's present vascularly, or is there another test that scans the vascular? Yeah, that's, if you have calcium in your coronary arteries, then there's plaque. That means plaque. That means there is now, when I do a calcium score on a person, I'll never label someone that's having coronary disease, but it is disease. It, it is coronary disease. Um, but we don't label someone with that because in, insurance companies will take that and just increase rates and whatever. Um, so if there's hard plaque, there's soft plaque. The hard plaque doesn't change, but the soft plaque associated with it can be reversed. Uh, so that would be a sign to say, hey, yeah, we need to keep your – Total cholesterol to below 150. Keep the LDL cholesterol less than 80, less than 70 in a diabetic. Um, again, for men over the 50, age of 55 who 
have no history of, of heart disease and you want to know what's going on internally, I think it's a good test. I, I've had patients who, I had a patient here in town who uh, we sent for a coronary calcium score in, and, and um, his heart went out of rhythm so they couldn't do the test. Well, I would have said, well, wait until we get him back in rhythm, but uh, they didn't call me and they, they did it. And they didn't tell us much about his heart, but they found lung cancer. And he went to uh, Mayo Clinic and it saved his life. It was very early cancer, but that's not unusual. When I was in Louisiana, we found quite a few cancers that we would not have seen just because we were taking a look at the heart and the radiologist has to look at everything that's there and, and we find early cancers in, 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 in patients. Um, I, I think it's a very worthwhile test. And again, men over the age of 45 and women over the age of 55, if you don't already have a diagnosis. Because we just get, with a treadmill test, you can pass the test and then have a heart attack a week later because most heart attacks occur in people with only 40 or 50 percent narrowing in the artery. It's not the critical narrowing. It's that soft plaque that's unstable that ruptures. You stabilize plaque by eating fruits and vegetables and uh, by having antioxidants, but you, you can never run out of supplements that they will sell us, you know. So it, it, life should be simple. You know, like the guy who didn't have to think, you know, he's going to live to be 97. He's not a thinker. So don't think about it, just eat whole foods, plant your garden, eat it, you know, stay away from $300 stress. That's what you got to do to get it. And then, but you're saying that calcium buildup isn't reversible to start with it? Well, when I talked to Carl with us then, when he came to town to, to visit, he said, hey, by the way, when your patients go on this diet and they repeat their calcium score, the, the, the calcium level may appear higher because when the artery cools off when the plaque stabilizes the, the, the calcium, if there's a bit more calcification, then it settles down. Um, so, yeah, the calcium may not go away. That's a hard plaque. But the soft plaque associated with the cholesterol, the soft stuff, goes away. Yeah, that melts away. Um, yeah, stress is uh, something we really should, uh, should avoid. Oh, the other thing, too, about the calcium score is that... Um, if you say you have chest pain, we all have chest pain. We, most of us ignore it. Um, uh, if you say you have arm pain or chest pain. Chest pain treat chest pain if you ignore it? No, no, no. If you have chest pain and you mention that, and you mention that, then the insurance company may pay for it. If you go in and say, I have no problems, I just want to do this test. But, you know, you, you know, say, oh, I have chest pain, I don't know if it's indigestion or whatever. The more information we put down, they're more likely to, to, to pay for it. Yeah, no, 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 we should not ignore it. If you have pressure, heaviness, squeezing, a squeezing discomfort coming on with exercise, then that would be, it sounds like angina. Uh, unfortunately, uh, women are so unusual in terms of their symptoms that they may just feel fatigued or tired. Um, it just can be vague complaints, and, and we should stop and listen because it may be a problem. Yes? Yeah, so, and now we'd actually, uh, in terms of brain injury or um, whatever a neurologist would suggest, um, would be what you do, but staying on a very healthy diet is, is the best thing to do. Can I say that taking supplements would help that? I really can't say. Uh, we're doing that. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that's a, a good point. Um, uh, a family member of mine had um, cancer, and uh, the doctor put her on whey protein. And I, was, and actually, I, I called Colin Campbell to get his opinion, and um, and he's and he agreed with me that 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 should not have been done. And so, um, yeah, so no, don't do that. If you have a if you have inflammation, if you have disease then actually protein can make you stronger, but it will make that disease process worse also.
so it's just better to stay on the anti-inflammatory diet. Um, it's a better thing to do. And uh, whatever is supposed to be good in any supplement, then find that food and eat the food. And try not, not use a supplement. Yeah, so, yeah, right, yeah, that's, that's a big difference. No, no, no. So we would take, the human body will take, so uh, animal protein has high-quality protein, and plants have low-quality protein, meaning that we have to break it down and build it back up to what we need. Uh, one big difference in animal protein versus plant protein is that there, there are more sulfur bonds within animal protein, so you have increased production of uh, homocysteine, which is an irritant and can cause um, plaque in arteries. Um, and the, uh, with the amount of, of supper bonding in animal protein, there's more work on the liver and kidneys to process, to get rid of the uh, impurities. Uh, whereas with plant protein, there's less supper bonding. Uh, the body will, you know, it used to be thought that you would have to um, mix, get different plants so that you get all the different amino acids at one time, but you don't. You can get them on different days and the body will gather those, rebuild it into the protein that we need. And that process of breaking it down and rebuilding is very good for the body. Uh, you need about 50 grams of protein a day and um, it, it, it's, it's almost, uh, it's, it's very easy to get the amount of protein that you need uh, on a daily basis. Uh, from plant protein. Um, I have some examples of some diets and how much protein. Um, so uh, the essential, in terms of for growth, you need about 50 grams of protein per day for, for most people. Um, beans, grains, nuts, seeds, and some vegetables are full of protein. Uh, a couple of lentils, 18 grams. Uh, quinoa, 8 grams. Uh, hemp seeds, 15 grams. Um, uh, C10, um, have 18 grams. Tofu, now if you get tofu, make sure it's organic. Uh, so here's some examples of um, tofu scramble, toast, fruit, lunch, uh, and for lunch, black beans, sweet potato salad, quinoa, cooked veggies. That, that's 69 grams in a day if you have that as a diet. For breakfast, raisin bran, soy milk, oh, you can use almond milk, banana, bean chili, salad, cornbread, brown rice, broccoli, uh, for the whole day, 87 grams of protein. So you get plenty of protein on a plant-based diet, just with mixing uh, some of these uh, menus. Okay. No, it's not. Yeah, so sometimes it'd be because of lack of exercise. If you do take a, uh, certain medicines can cause, cr cause cramps. Um, uh, statins, for instance, you have increased cramps. Uh, if you're on a diuretic, a fluid pill, that, that can cause cramps. But, but it can happen just with lack of exercise. So walking may help. Um, if you have restless legs, then you tend to cramp anyway. But, but it's not, an, um, if you have pain on walking, that could be, Yeah, when I was over at the um, co-op, um, uh, you got, got, got saw their organic soy, and, uh, and they assured me that it was non-GMO, and it was actually produced, I think, um, somewhere around Delta Junction and one place is there. Yeah, but it, you're right, that is a concern. Yeah. Uh, the closest thing we can get to not being non-GMO would be organic, and I was, I've been told that if it's Organic soy that is not GMO. Yeah. But it, for instance now, uh, for like at, at some of the coffee places, it's almond milk that's available. 
Brother, so I, yeah, so, right. Yeah. And, and so the, the statement here was to get non-GMO uh, verified soy milk. Uh, yeah, this is different. That is different. Um, uh, it's not the same plaque. But now you can develop organic brain syndrome from plaque in the small blood vessels in the brain that cause little tiny mini strokes. And that can cause senility or what appears to be Alzheimer's, but is not uh, the same. Um, but this is uh, the plaque in the brain for Alzheimer's is outside the blood vessels and within the nervous tissue uh, itself. Uh, uh, one thing that's important is that the vitamin D deficiency has been associated with increased risk for Alzheimer's. So uh, we really need to make sure we keep our vitamin D levels up. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you all very much. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, As you can see, this is such an interesting topic and so much to think about and take home. My biggest points were not go to work um, because that's <laughs> when we'll have a heart attack. <laughs> and then go to Hawaii frequently to get vitamin D. So I think those are good recommendations. Um, next week we have um, Dr. Jay Butler, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the State of Alaska. And he'll be flying up from Anchorage to talk to us about infection control. So that should be pretty interesting, especially in light of some of these um, MERS and Ebola and flu and, and should we be concerned as Alaskans. Also, um, this presentation is recorded and so it will be up at uh, um, a YouTube link on Summer Sessions <coughs> website. So um, uaf.edu backslash summer and you'll be able to get directed from there. So I hope to see you next week and thank you all for coming. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. But but you do recommend. I mean, I'm perfectly good help. But you do recommend getting a, a baseline for mm -hmm. the heart thing. I do. Can you yeah. just go into your doctor and ask for it? You can. And actually, what I think that would be good to do is, you know, that risk analysis that they do online. Yes. Uh, to do that. Uh-huh. And uh, you really should know, do you know what your cholesterol is? Not anymore. I've never now, so, you know, years. Now, what the new recommendations are, uh, if, if someone's 75 or older, then, then there's not proof that taking a statin is going to make a difference. They think it will, but it's not been proven because uh -huh. enough people of 75 have not been studied. Uh -huh. But I would still say, you know, if you love your family, you're doing fine, then find out how you're doing and correct any little problems that are there. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, really. I still speak to that precisely. Hello, Doc. <laughs> hey, hi. I'm mentioned. Ah. Oh, great. I lost my brother at the age of 51. Oh, goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I hope you didn't mind. No, Please. not at all. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. 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 We've been telling everybody, go get yourself checked with the doctor. Mm -hmm. Go find out what the heck is going on. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So right, we're, yeah. We're definitely part of the choir. Great. Yeah. Wonderful. We're going to go pick up more organic food yes. now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, you don't. You can just call Porter Hort and tell him that you heard me speak and you want to see me. And we'll work it out. Talking about water. Tea is tea. Would be considered water.
Well, not quite, but but if it's green tea, I mean, tea is good for us, you know. But um, tea and coffee really it really isn't dehydrating. Alcohol is. Yeah. So so we have to count for. I drink a lot of green tea. Oh, good. Is yeah. that or is that the same as water? Uh, not quite the same, but close. Okay. Yeah, it is hydrating somewhat. Do you use the tea bags? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, it does give you some, but uh, have some water, too. Okay, okay. okay. Great. Thank, you. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Very You're welcome. Thank you. See you. See you. All right. I wanted to ask a second question, which was, mm -hmm. I was aggressively treated about when I was 50 with I had high blood pressure, high cholesterol, family history of heart disease, uh, all sides of the family. Um, grandmother died young. So I treated with it. I hadn't been able to get my exercise and my food act together. Now I've got that together. My F levels are in the, mm -hmm. the low, but I'm on the smallest of the Lipitor and doing the blood pressure medications. Can I, should I take, stop that to see how I'm doing and more aggressively treat it with food and exercise? I, I mean, is there yeah, a harm yeah. from taking them? I mean, I'm 60 now, so. Yeah, so the question is, you know, I, I think we should find out, do you really need a statin? Yeah. And you can do that with that online um, um, Yeah, I'd have calculator. to get my current le levels. But having yeah. been, I was really high at one point. Yeah. And I've yeah. asked yeah, most of us have to stay on statins, have to stay on to keep those levels down. Uh -huh. But if you change your diet significantly, then you may not need them. So I think it's reasonable to stop and then recheck your levels and then have your doctor do the risk calculator to see if you really need to take a statin. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to do that. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. So statins <laughs> cause, cause blood sugar to go up a little bit. Uh -huh. It can cause a little bit of memory loss. So, so oh, well, that my heart... Heart disease, Alzheimer's, or mm -hmm. both, mm -hmm. those are my risk factors. Yeah. So we don't have cancer in my family. We have those two. Yeah. So yeah, if you come off your stand, so if your cholesterol goes back up, you can always skip right back on though. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but have you done to do the risk calculator? Yeah, yeah it's, it's just simple to do. Anyone can download it and do it. Do they have any tests for women for the chest pain issues? I mean, it seems like it could end up in the emergency room a lot. You, you can, but you know, if you are old enough, if you're 55 and older, the captain score would be helpful just to find out, do you have plaque? Yeah. You know? And then we have just allow... My grandmother was an angina. Yeah. It's 64, I think. Right. And, and then we decide on what type of stress test to do if you need one. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. I've got a cholesterol question. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm vegan, and I've been vegan for about two years now. Pretty, pretty so you're taking B12? Vegan, taking B12. Mm -hmm. So lean wool, uh, which one do you use? Um, the, uh, well, I take what's in Permans mostly. I take Permans multivitamin. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh -huh. I, every once in a while, I'll yeah. take one other one that's sub mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just because sometimes I just feel like I just need another one. I'm tired. I need to tired. see what, he, what, what, what he's prescribing. Yeah. And, um, I, um, I, I, well, John's going to see you in, in, in August, but maybe he'll bring the list. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, well, I, John, when he, he went, when we went vegan, he, mostly vegan, his mm -hmm. cholesterol dropped instantly. Mine is still at the same level it was before, and it's about 220. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we should do a risk high. analysis on you to see if you need a statin. So Whether you take it or not, to see if you need it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good, good luck getting you to take it. But, yeah. but my, my, uh, my doctor is, doesn't worry too much about it because, well, she knows I don't want to take statin. But the other thing is that my good cholesterol is is pretty pretty high. I know. I mean, but well, I don't I, know. I, I but, but that's not that. enough. Because my good cholesterol runs about seventy or eighty. I think that's what mine is in that. Yeah, range. but I have a hunk of calcium in my LAD, and that's why I became vegetarian, vegan most of the time. Uh -huh. Yeah, because and of so that. Yeah. that. I do. Huh. I do. I mean, because so. I'm in that risk. I, I'm in that 90 percent percentile where you're predicted to die within 10 years. So I made a change in 2007. You know, so, so seven got to 10 in? years yet. So we'll yeah. see. You, feel, you think I should come in and get one of those tests? Should I come? Where should I come? Like so, if you have your levels, we can do the risk analysis for you. Yeah. Yeah. My blood pressure is low. Everything else is good. 
Yeah. You mean uh, get, come in and get a cornea counseling score? Yeah, should I do that? Yeah. Should I come, will, will Medicare pay for it? It might. If we, if might, we, if if it we might say not. you have chest pain. I don't. <laughs> I don't have any risk factors like that. Like Everybody that has chest pain. pain. You just don't notice it. <laughs> I, have, I have a... He's trying to tell you. <laughs> I know. Well, I do have a, a mitral valve prolapse. Yeah. Can we something. say that? Yeah. 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 Well, we'll say something. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we should do the risk analysis of it, see if you really need to take a statin. Okay. You may not need to. Okay. All right. Yeah. Look, I saw a patient with a cholesterol of 309. Her LDL is 199. And um, we did a coronary counseling score. The score was zero. Well, you know what's So she feels so much better yeah, I knowing do that. that she doesn't have plaque yeah. at this point. Well, what, I might just what, what percentage what of people have, like, that are over 50 or 60 have plaque? plaque. 50% of us. Oh, really? Yeah. It's, it's yeah. a natural. I mean, you know. You're going to get some plaque. Well, some of us do. Some people yeah. so I saw, I saw an, uh, an 80 year old lady when I was getting training for doing coronary CT. Yeah. And she went in to get a capsule score. And I said, man, she's wasting her money. Her score was zero. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I probably won't be as lucky as that. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is cool. That's a good well, score I mean, to have. Cool. Yeah. I, mean, but, I mean, you don't usually see, see people that go vegan and their cholesterol doesn't change, do you? Most of them do change. I mean, but there are some genetic issues and sometimes yeah, they don't. Yeah, yeah. yeah. my mother is yeah. just high. Yeah. 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 That's it. So, I mean, so, I'm, I'm just like, watch. I'm mean, always telling my doctor I'm watching yeah. John's cholesterol. Because yeah, he's a drop when I... Yeah, yeah. So you, you, the liver has four receptors to tell us to monitor how much LDL is there, and you don't, you may only have two receptors. So your liver keeps reducing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Right, thank you. Right. So are you, are you the only cardiologist in town? No, no, no. There are uh, actually three cardiologists in town right now. There are two in the group that I'm with, myself and another guy. But we were, we just recruited another person. So there will be three cardiologists in our group, and there's a solo practitioner, Dr. Cyber. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I remember you're an interventionist, reading. So that means you're preventative medicine. So you're trying to help people before they have one. It says you're interventionist. Yeah, so interventionist means that we do, I do stents. I go in, like that young lady show, they do balloons and stents. Okay. But I'm trying to keep people away from that. Yeah. So interventional, we are invasive. You're invasive. You're, you're, invasive. you're going in the body. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I do that, and that, that's where we, yeah. you know, but... but so uh, an electrophysiologist is not invasive. Right. Electrophysiologist will do, uh, take care of chronic arrhythmias. But I do a little bit of both. I, I put in pacemakers, you know, and I handle heart rhythm problems, but we work closely with the cardiologist in Anchorage also. What's the difference yeah. between the stroke monitor and the uh, EKG? What, what, yeah, what, yeah. what are they, what are they both... What, yeah. what is each telling? Yeah, so with the 12 lead EKG, we're looking okay. at different regions of the heart. QT wavelength intervals? Oh, uh, we're looking at QT, we're looking at the uh, the voltage, and uh, we're looking at we're looking for Q waves if it's been OMI. Okay. And just for the monitor strip, we're just looking at the rhythm. It's a sinus rhythm. One's electrical, one's rhythm. rhythm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. And so the other one, yeah, we're looking at rhythm plus other information. It's a fascinating area, too. How that, oh, it is. How yeah, how that, pump, that pump needs electricity to run. Hey, you yeah. know one thing. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm picking on. No, I think he's the one yeah. who has a yeah. question. Yeah, I, I, I just, I, I just, okay, okay. Uh, you can keep going. Well, I, okay, I don't want um, up on that screen. You showed the countries where where yeah. longevity seemed to be mm -hmm. pronounced, and I think it was yeah. in Okinawa, and, and it said they eat until they're 80 percent full. And I went, that's that's a big one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Now, what do they have for that? Like, yeah, so because everyone yeah. stuffs himself in there. Right. It's yeah. Like, yeah. These yeah. people know when to stop. Yeah, yeah, that's right. They do. Don't overeat. It's very important. Yeah. So I got a yeah. question because mm -hmm. I'm fascinated by all this stuff. I've read, you know, all these yeah. books. You know, you know the blood type, zone diet. You know, I tried all these diets. I tried uh -huh. them on myself. I experimented. And then right now I'm doing the wheat belly. You know, that one. But you, you know, your, your yeah. guys, your lineage of people are looking at no, 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 or something like that. But I'm looking at thinking I want to try the. Megan, I've never tried that. It'd be so nice with the to Loma Linda, mm -hmm. people just can I just like go, you know just Google Loma Linda? Would that be a helpful thing? To, it would be. It would be. Because I know they're you, really advocates for it. They, they really are, and then actually, Essison's book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. I mean, that's strictly vegan. Is that on your thing? Is prevent Reverse Heart Disease? Uh, is it no, on? it doesn't say that specifically. But <laughs> Prevent Reverse Heart Disease, okay. Oh well, that's the that, that's the gold standard. Yeah, that's the one Bill Clinton. Clinton. Oh, okay. I could Clinton. Google about Clinton and, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there would be right there. 
Yeah, yeah, we're clean. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. he's like. He's <laughs> I, turned, I turned his mic off. Yeah. Hey, doctor, do you, yeah. do, you do, do you do you get any extra testimony? Do you do you do extra testimony? Well, they they don't allow me because I'm an employee physician. Okay. Do it banner. Yeah, banner health. Yeah, 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 yeah conflict yeah. of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the thing is that they won't. I mean, I have to go through banner to do that, and they say no, you can't yeah, unless yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and yeah. if the suit was in town. What's your name? If I tell you, you'll probably know who I'm suing. <laughs> it's Cook. Last name. No, no, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Larry Farnham, man, or did you go to the RC? Oh, uh, okay. Baja Road? 